Thank you, thank you, Dirk Willem. Well, there's so, there's so much that he basically uh, told us about how, um, how to um, start our career, um, how to build software, uh, how to deal with licenses. This, it's so much, uh, so much things I have questions about. Uh, and I can imagine you have questions for uh, Dirk Willem as well. If you have, uh, you, can, you can put them on, on Twitter or you can raise your hand and then I will, uh, I will assign the, the mic to, uh, to you. Uh, and if you want to ask a question, Please stand up when you get the mic, then we get a, a clear view of you, and then you can answer your uh, ask your your question. But and, just and Dutch is fine. I'll translate, and that's that's good. So uh, so to start off, um, you you quoted uh, uh, John Stevens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have examples of, of where a license is a, a, a ruined project? Right. So um, um, I think of a good example. So we've had a. Um, so we've had a, a whole range of extremely good databases, um, uh, uh, which have effectively sort of like, um, yeah, never got off the ground because uh, Postgres and, and, and MySQL, um, yeah, basically had the better license. So, so in fact, these, 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 these very good pieces of technology sort of like never got the light of day. Uh, we've also had a whole range of technology around, for example, compilers, uh, which could do absolutely amazing things. Uh, but since the license of like was contaminating enough, that was not something the, the industry as a whole picked up, and that's why we're still like compiling, for example, Linux with GCC, even though it's not exactly state of the art. So we sort of like have these examples in, in most of those, yeah, in actually quite a lot of areas. If you go in the in the areas of graphics, if you go in the areas of video compression, the situation gets even sadder because in those areas it's not just licenses which bind you, it's also uh, uh, patent issues which license you as well. Unfortunately, uh, for most of us, patents actually came quite late in the software world because for a long time you couldn't patent software. So that was something we only started to sort of like tackle in the last 10 years. So a lot of technology from before that, yeah, sort of like gets, gets harmed there. And what are the biggest problems with with licenses, w w which you tackle with the patch? Right. So, so the, so there are a couple of things. So, first of all, if you if you take a very permissive, nice license, like the Apache license, the, the MIT license, the Boost license, which basically means you can do anything with this code which you want, it does mean that someone can take that code, run away with it, make it completely commercial, improve it tremendously, and never give it back, which can be really frustrating for the community as a whole. So, so. That's kind of like a problem if most people in the community are tool makers. If your job is making a tool and suddenly someone else takes that tool, makes it better and doesn't give you back, then, then that's a problem. If you're, for example, um, let's say, uh, uh, like in my case, if, if you're a civil servant and you're working on the tool and the tool is not there for the tool, like for, for Apache, it, it's, it's there to get weather pictures out, you don't care at all that someone actually picks it up and makes a much better version of it. In fact, that's, that's kind of like funny because basically you're making it for that particular code. So that's kind of like, and you could have exactly the opposite. So like you can say like, well, for example, I've got something on the GPL code, on the GPL license, which says, says like if you use this code and you modify it or improve it, you have to give it back. Um, uh, uh, so that effectively means that if you have a whole bunch of business models which are really reliant on selling software, um, yeah, that's a bit hard if you also have to get source code and that person can give source code to everyone else. So that, that breaks that business model. But if you're, for example, Red Hat, you do really, really well out of actually supp uh, supplying support. So in many ways, the licenses sort of like shape the businesses you can have uh, around that. And uh, today we wouldn't have like uh, Google or, or, or Apple or all these other organizations. They wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that enormous stack of open source they could, could yeah. live in. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one other question about the licenses was uh, posted on Twitter. Um, uh, how, how are these open source licenses uh, enforced or protected? Is it something that, that Apache does or is, is right. who is yeah. doing so, that? So there, there are two aspects there. So the first one is the first purpose of licenses is actually to protect the developers. Because like it or not, software companies are worth billions, venture capitalists, well, they care about money. So, so the first and foremost things you have a license for is to protect your own ass, because otherwise, and that's just the reality of life, you get sued, it basically it ends up in tears. So the first thing a license does, it helps basically protect the developer. So the Apache Software Foundation is a legal entity with a lot of process, very boring process, very annoying process, to just sort of like make sure that it can protect its own developer. So when you contribute in Apache and you stick to the rules, you're effectively shielded by that organization, by the license. So that's, that's the first part. And, then, and license action is actually not uncommon. And if you, uh, you've also like seen the, the fight between Oracle and, 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 and Google, for example, over some aspects of the, of the license. Um, the other sort of like aspect is sort of like if you're a company and you're sort of like violating the license. Um, now, it, it, Generally, sort of like in the BSD world, in the Apache world, because you, the, the license is like, here's a piece of code, do with it what you want. The culture of that community is not to go after 
someone who does what they want because XT license says it's fine. So, but if you, for example, you're in, let's say, in, on the GPL GNU side, it says like you, when you do something with the software, you make it better, you should just give it back. So developers rightly say to companies like, you've made something better, give it back. So what you see, and if you actually search on Google, you'll find a lot of examples, for example, in Europe, in Germany, and so on, where actually large co corporations which made embedded hardware, which made a little um, TV player and things like that, got forced to actually make their source code, make their improvements public. And the license actually is, I mean, it doesn't happen weekly, but it certainly happens monthly. And in most cases, um, the companies, so like once they get confronted with this, they go like, oh dear, or they go like, oh, we're not paying, and then their lawyers get involved, and they go like, oh, we're terribly sorry, They'll fix it and they'll give a nice donation and you hear nothing of it. But occasionally, sort of like, especially in Germany, if some companies have held out long and actually turned into lawsuits. And um, yeah, uh, the, the, the little known fact is that usually <laughs> uh, open source wins. I, in fact, I can't think of any example where that wasn't the case. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. So um, does anyone have a question? Wants to ask a question right now? I have tons of them, so uh, I, could, I could continue. Um, um, so think of something, and if you have any question, just post it on, on Twitter, and I will ask it, uh, ask it for you. Um, so um, one other thing I, I really wanted to know, um, you shared the, the, the quadrant mm -hmm. of, of how you should um, develop yourself as a developer. Yep. Um, um, uh, what's, what's the most important thing uh, you would uh, you would give out to, to the students here to work on? Right, so, uh, so the first thing I would do is I would not aim for all of them. I would really sort of like figure out why are you in this? Are you in this to really make a difference for your users? Do you really sort of like want to do something with technology and, and really accomplish something like make make hotel bookings much better or whatever it is you want to do, basically make, make uh, collecting the taxes much better. I mean, it doesn't really matter, making, making, getting weather pictures to anyone in the world. Is that what you really want to do? Is like really on that? Or do you really sort of like want to make the technology much more beautiful, much shinier, much nicer? So you really care in depth about the technology. Or do, are you really interested in sort of like the whole process around it, sort of like how a piece of technology is being applied to, yeah, basically to, to a problem and, and understand that problem. And so, so sort of like pick those areas and sort of like then dive into it because the skills between them are very different and, and it's usually like, yeah, just a, a matter of personal preference, what you like and what, what you don't like. Um, I certainly sort of like myself sort of like thought that technology, I still think technology is really rather shiny and interesting, but actually I found that actually what's way more interesting is sort of like how organizations build technology and, and how sort of like organizations interact and why it sometimes works and why it sometimes doesn't work. C could you share uh, where, where did you start? Well, so I started as a biophysicist doing, uh, doing uh, satellite pictures of algae. Um, uh, and then sort of like basically I got sort of like sucked in through a very, very gradual path. Um, but one of the things which open source sort of like helped me do, and, and, and that was, all, was pretty much from the beginning, was you very quickly realize that the hard part about software development isn't actually writing code. That's something you learn after a while, you get better and better in it, and after five years or ten years you're actually fairly good at it. Um, the real problem is to sort of like coordinate lots of people uh, to write code together, so they don't stand on each other's toes, that you actually deliver all those things. And that actually turns out, for me, sort of like to be the hard part to learn, but also the most, most interesting part to learn. Especially because um, the organizations around you, they have reasons why they want you to do that. So somehow you have to deliver those, and those reasons conflict, and often they want the best thing tomorrow very simple. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't work, right? So you kind of like need to figure that out, and then all of a sudden it becomes interesting engineering again. And yeah, that, that's very addictive. Do you, do you still actually code? Um, s yes, I have to admit. So, so occasionally, sort of like there are like uh, security issues or other issues in very arcane, embarrassingly old code, and I help fix it. And the other thing I, I occasionally sort of like do is sort of like basically I do a lot of work for for startups and large companies when they have basically have got problems. And sometimes it is actually helpful to sort of like do a little bit of code and show like well this is roughly the pattern. But I'm certainly sort of like old and rusty, and I do these old languages like Perl and C and, and Java and so on. So that's that's definitely not uh, not where it is today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, oh, do you have some example of of some uh, some of the problems you work on right now with with uh, with other companies or startups? Um, so, so for example, like like the the, the most recent ones of like I worked on, uh, the, which are kind of completely completed now, was uh, was at the, at the BBC at the English Broadcaster, and there really the problem was that that organisation had outsourced all of its IT and wanted to sort of like insource it again. So there, effectively, you had to sort of like basically set up and retrain a whole uh, yeah a whole community of developers to turn out modern uh, open source based stacks. And one of the problems, and this actually, if, if you sort of like want to work for a government, this is something which is really interesting. Governments have unique problems. Because, and also like large broadcasters as well, because there are not so many governments in the world. There is only one Dutch government in the world. There's only one Dutch tax office. So generally that means that 
even though some of their problems are similar to the countries around them, a lot of it is unique. And you can't just be, make a mass software product for a very unique need. So what you find is that those large government organizations, there are typically extremely unique problems, and there is no company in the world which is ever going to write for that, because then they would have one customer, and that, that, that just doesn't work commercially. So what you usually find are sort of like very yeah, interesting uh, problems. And the one at the BBC, which was the, the, the really interesting one, is the BBC is funded by the public by a license fee, uh, basically pretty much like it used to be in the Netherlands, so fixed fee per person. So that means that if their website gets twice as popular, they need to figure out how to do it twice as cheap, because they don't get a penny more. All technology in the world is based on if you get more traffic, you get more money, and therefore you can sp buy bigger things. For a public organization, it's the opposite, right? If you get more popular, you better figure out how to do this more efficient. And that's problematic in IT, because if you buy a, a, hundred gigabit, a hundred megabit router or a one gigabit router, you can buy them at the Dixons, or well, you could buy them at the Dixons, they're like a few hundred, hundred euros, that's it. If you want to have one with 10 gigs, or one which is 10 times as fast, that's not 1,000 euros, that's not 10 times as expensive, that's about 500 times as expensive to 1,000 times as expensive. So, interestingly, if the entire substrate you're working on becomes, for every time you go, everything becomes 10 times bigger, 10 times better, 10 times whatever, it becomes usually 100 to 500 times as expensive. But you, as a public service organization, let's say you're the tax office and you're trying to sort of like have a system, your backups for the tax office, you actually don't want that to happen because you're not making necessarily more money that way. So that's kind of like at the BBC, that was the most challenging, fun engineering problem. Like, how do you build a stack that scales and scales and scales and scales without sort of like getting exponentially more, uh, more, more expensive? Yeah, cool. Um, uh, it's a little bit of other question. So, uh, who of you is actually contributing to an open source project? I got to your. Yeah, uh, just a sec. Uh, who, who of you is actually uh, working on an open source project? Can I sh see a show of hands? Okay, so, so a quick question before I answer, or you can ans uh, ask yours. Um, how, how would you advise uh, the students to get started in open source? Because op you, you, you told open s getting started in open source is really yeah. good for... So, so actually, in most cases, it's actually r really rather simple. Um, I find it typically works best also for me if you pick something which you need yourself for something, for a little experiment, to control something, to do something, whatever it is, right? I mean, something simple. And then you typically find that you're actually sort of like, it doesn't quite work that way. So you sort of like then, rather than sort of like ignoring it or find a workaround, you sort of like ask on the mailing list, like, how should this work? And then quite quickly you find out that either it's a bug in the program or the documentation is quite clear. And then sort of like, you sort of like quite quickly get into a, a sort of like situation where you can have a conversation with the community, like, hey, perhaps you could make the documentation a little bit better, and you may perhaps give an example of that, or actually like, actually this is how you would fix that bug, and you sort of like can have a dialogue over that. Quite quickly, once you've gotten yourself a little bit into it, you find that you can actually help others asking the same question. So someone else asks an interesting question. You, of course, won't know the answer, but you can actually look at the source code and figure out actually what the answer should be. And actually figure out, like, why did this person actually even ask it in the first place? Because that's actually a skill which in the, in the rest of your life you will be doing all the time, actually like trying to figure out not just what the answer is, but why is the person even asking this? So that's something you can pick up very, very quickly, even without writing a single line of code. Usually what you discover is that the quickest way of explaining how it works is actually making it work more logical, so you fix the code and then say, like, well, it's fixed now and this is actually how it works. Because that's usually for programs actually a much quicker way of fixing it. <laughs> a question from a gentleman. Uh, my question is, where do you see Apache Web Server next 10, 15 years uh, in terms of uh, modern uh, web servers? Would it be replaced or evolved in terms of market share? Thanks. Right, so, so, uh, so it's a question sort of like, where do you see Apache in like, like 10 years or so? Um, so, first of all, I hope it gets replaced by something more modern, something more advanced than everything else, right? Because we're really talking 1980s technologies. It's written in C from before C++, certainly uh, no, no standard C++ templates. So it's, it's, a ver it's, it's not a very advanced uh, piece of code. Um, reality is, and that's actually a sad reality for everyone here, is enterprise software or, or that type of software, infrastructure software, has lifetimes of at least 20 years, if not 30, 40 years. So, absolutely, in 20 years' time, Apache will still be there. <laughs> It's unavoidable. That's just basically because that's just the nature of an infrastructure piece of software. I mean, and if you look at sort of like other things in our stack, 
the world still relies on, on very old binaries and, and very old, old pieces of software, uh, basically dating, dating back to the 70s, and there's just, there's just no way around that. So, so first of all, so Apache will still be around. I am hoping, though, that sort of like it will get replaced. And I'm hoping that it won't get replaced by one thing. I'm really hoping that the current trend of having different things replacing it continues, so that we see things like Engine X for certain type of like very fast, but possibly somewhat unreliable and somewhat messy type of things, that we see another one popping up for very secure type of delivery, that we see a third one popping up, for example, which is really able to do like privacy and things like that around that really well. So I'm hoping sort of like it re re gets replaced by, yeah, or, or get it augmented. Reality is, be anything low in the stack, typically there is no win in replacing it really. Uh, and since CPUs get much faster than, than software gets faster, uh, there are usually no incentives to, to, to modify software low in the stack. So in reality, I think it will actually be, be happening quite slowly. And if you looked at those graphs, if you looked at them very carefully and you sort of like take out some of the marketing from those graphs, then you see actually that, that Apache has, has basically more or less been constant uh, sort of like at that top line for a very long time. And the only reason why it's dipping and, and, and shining something is because very large hosting providers, which host millions and millions of empty websites because they're, they're squatting domains, sort of like switch uh, to another provider. So I think that's probably a trend we're going to see. I mean, it's a bit sad, but that's I think the, the reality of it. Anyone else has a question? Okay, then uh, to close off, um, if you, if you could um, if you could uh, give one piece of advice to these uh, students uh, uh, to go forward with their careers, what would it be? Well, pick the thing you pick the thing which is fun. I mean, that's that's basically what, what yeah, that's what I've always done. So, like, pick the thing which is the most fun because IT is so incredibly large and there's so 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 much need. You can basically yeah find that niche which you really enjoy, and then you find out there are actually lots of jobs in it. Thank you, Dirk Willem. Okay.